When most people think of a forest, they think of a jungle, or maybe maple and oak trees turning red in autumn. Forests of trees are an incredibly important ecosystem. They protect and create soil, pull carbon dioxide from the air, and provide habitat and food for hundreds of species. But underwater, there's another type of forest that's equally important. But instead of being made of trees, it's formed by algae. Kelp forests are some of the most dynamic and diverse forests on the entire planet, but they don't exist everywhere. Here's Nancy Caruso, a scientist who has worked to restore kelp forests off the coast of California. So where does kelp grow? As I said, it doesn't grow everywhere in the world, only a few different places, like here in Southern California, or if you live in Northern Baja, Mexico. It grows off the coast of Alaska, it grows off the southwest coast of South America, and it grows off of the uh, southeast coast of Australia, and also around New Zealand's islands. And those are the only places you can find this particular species of kelp, which is called giant kelp, or Macrocystis pyrifera is the scientific name. This giant kelp does not grow around Europe and Africa, but they do have different species of kelp that grows there. Kelp performs photosynthesis, but it's not a plant. It's classified as an algae, or protist. It doesn't have seeds or flowers. It reproduces by dropping microscopic spores from the edges of its fronds. And it doesn't have specialized cells that transport water and nutrients from roots up to leaves like most plants do. All of the cells inside giant kelp are actually pretty similar. And this organism is one of the fastest growing organisms on the planet. To get a feel for what kelp forest is really like, we have to go underwater. I haven't ever been scuba diving before, so I reached out to Pat Webster to get a feel for what it's like to be inside a kelp forest. How often do you dive, typically? Uh, typically in a year, I'm, I'm averaging about 120 dives, give or take, in a year, so pretty much every third day. The footage that Patrick shared with me is incredible. It's like an underwater cathedral with shafts of light coming through stained glass windows in the canopy above and the variety of animals. I'm amazed. If you were to ask an alien for directions to Earth in the cosmos, the other aliens would be like, oh, the one with the ocean. If they're looking for um, habitable planets, Earth-like planets, they're looking for liquid water. You live on on ocean, like planet ocean. Mm -hmm. If we had that switch, how different would our politics be? How different would everything be? The, yeah, the perspective that you get looking out into the cosmos is something that a lot of people really appreciate, feeling small in that bigger picture. And you can do that instantly, day by day, without the night, just saying, you live on planet ocean. And that changes everything. Kelp forests are my favorite place to be, but jellies are some of my favorite animals to witness because that's ocean life. You know, like that is, that is something that is the water coming to say hello. One of my favorite analogies I ever heard uh, was on a whale watch boat and someone was saying that we know the lives of whales like you would know the life of a human if you were a tomato in their fridge and all you saw of them was when they opened up the door to the fridge and closed it. The kelp forest contains so many fascinating species. There are brightly colored invertebrates like these nudibranchs, schools of fish, delicate jellyfish, sea otters, sea stars, and more. And all of them are here because of the kelp. But kelp forests exist in a delicate balance without sea otters and starfish to keep the sea urchins in check. The urchins can devour the kelp, turning what was once an underwater forest into a wasteland. Let's talk about what happened to the kelp. And now around the world, actually, 
there's been a decline in all species of kelps wherever they grow. The sea otter was killed in the 1800s, in the early 1900s, for their fur. So we got rid of the sea otters, and as you saw in the food chain, if you got rid of a predator, then might, what might happen to some of the prey? You'll start to see a lot more of them. That's right. So you'll start to see a lot more of the sea urchins. The urchins started to grow and proliferate, reproduce, and take over the reefs. So here's our giant kelp with tons of purple urchins and red sea urchins devouring the holdfast. So if you devour the holdfast, it can't hold on anymore. And the kelp just floats away with all those nematocysts buoying it up to the surface. The second thing that happened here along the California coast is that we built millions of homes and we covered over the dirt with sidewalks and parking lots. The rain literally washes the earth and everything that was on all that pavement washes right into the ocean and it's kind of nasty stuff. So it started making our water really murky along the coast. So you, if, you, if you have murky water, sunlight can't get to the bottom. And of course, giant kelp needs sunlight to grow. When it starts off its life, it's microscopic. It has to grow from the bottom all the way to the surface with the sunlight. The next thing that happened to our ecosystem, because it takes a lot of things to make an ecosystem collapse, not just one thing, was a giant storm. In 1983, there was the largest El Nino system that has ever occurred in recorded history. So we had 50 foot waves hitting our coastline and it actually ripped out all the rest of the kelp that was still alive uh, after being, you know, going through all those different stresses for a hundred years. And so you see all this kelp washed up on the beach, that was the end. That's kelp that That's washed kelp. up on the beach? Yep. Oh my goodness. Changing water temperatures, storms, and a virus wiped out the sun stars, one of the sea urchins' main predators. And all of these stresses combined caused the kelp forests off the coast of California to disappear. Nancy worked with thousands of volunteers to remove sea urchins and to replant kelp, and after more than a decade of work, the kelp forests began to return. But these forests are vulnerable to climate change. In Monterey Bay, which is in central California, Patrick has seen significant changes in just the 10 years that he's been diving. So many different Southern California animals now kind of live here full time. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you learn how to dive now, that fish assemblage that is Southern California is here. There's no distinction. So that's a change that I've seen personally just within 10 years because of this hot water incursion. We are land dwelling animals and some of us might be wondering why it matters if kelp is around or not. It creates such a huge biomass. It's such a large ecosystem. It produces lots of oxygen and it takes up lots of carbon in our oceans. There's thousands of products that contain kelp. You're saying kelp is in a lot of our food. How is that? Because most people don't eat seaweed for breakfast. That's true. But giant kelp has a compound in it called sodium alginate. Kelp products like sodium alginate are used to help thicken foods, to give toothpaste a better texture, and agar is used in literally thousands of products, such as petri dishes for scientific research. But if kelp derivatives are edible and found in so many foods, what about just eating kelp? Turns out there's a small company in Southeast Alaska called Barnacle Foods that is doing just that. They're making kelp salsa, and it's one of the best salsas I've ever eaten. Kelp salsa is actually a traditional food here in Southeast Alaska. So it's a, a recipe and a, a pantry staple that's been around for generations. And it has to do with the limited seasonal bounty that we do have being this far north. And seaweed happens to be something that we're extremely rich in. We learned our recipe from friends of friends and I'll also admit that the first time I was invited to a kelp salsa making party, I was a little bit skeptical. <laughs> I didn't know what it was going to taste like. Yeah, kelp could definitely play a big role in, in humans' diets, and it can be used as a garnish and as a, a base for lots of different condiments like we're currently producing, um, and then as a, as a dried 
um, ingredient. It also can be blended into a lot of different grains or staple products. Um, calorically, it is not extremely high in calories, but in nutrient density, it has one of the highest levels of nutrients of any food on the planet. Is there anything that the rest of us can do to just help kelp forests? Well, kelp forests need clean water and uh, they need sunlight. So wherever you live, no matter where you live, you're connected to a river um, and the rivers all flow to the oceans. So take care of where you live and that helps everything in the ocean. I want to give a big thank you to Nancy Crusoe, Patrick Webster, and Matt Kern at Barnacle Foods. You can learn more about Nancy's restoration efforts at Get Inspired. Check out Patrick by following Underwater Pat on social media. He has some of the most amazing underwater photographs and videos I've ever seen. You'll really want to give him a follow and check out what he's doing. And you can order salsa, hot sauce, jam, and other kelp foods directly from Barnacle Foods website. Their salsa is amazing. We ordered four different varieties and ate them all before we got to filming. That's how good they were. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed learning more about kelp forests. Work hard, grow smart, and we'll see you next time.